I don't have anybody else in the waiting room if you want to go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And welcome to our Rare Disease Day event here from Florida. Show your stripes. Um, we're super excited that you're with us today. I am um, one of your ambassadors, Joani. But before we get started, we want to, of course, share a, a short video and a welcome from our uh, CEO, Nord CEO. Just want to make sure that everyone's aware Nord does not recommend um, any specific medical treatments uh, for, for everyone that is in, in our event. I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunaishi, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Minyusu Rutan. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Anapenda kunitazama nikipuliza mapovu. Yai el querida, os pelos pil minha família, né? Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari-harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O var me pulog. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. Atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumuona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavifurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik perhubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Their fierce support. Sua bondade inabalável. Their big big love. Minha vender. Cloarga. Enfermeiras. Doctors. Support workers. Assistente. Mashirika ya wagonjwa. Together we are a strong community. Nime weza kuelekewa. Histórias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Oh, como é que ele está? I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has cask, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafiq dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha leiomiosarcoma, um câncer raro. Who you need, Harvey? Ana SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. Leon Christian, oi, ai, har ui, me é fat pé, chorret. Esta é minha vida. Suara saia. And I am more than my disease. We are rare. Camira mãe. Nós somos fortes. And we are proud. Welcome, I'm Peter Saltonstall, President and CEO of the National Organization for Rare Disorders, and would like to welcome you to our 2021 Virtual Rare Disease Day event. But before we begin, I'd like to send out a special thank you to all those advocates and others who have spent so much energy and time supporting the rare disease community. So thank you. The role of Rare Disease Day is to bring together advocates and patients from around the world to help tell the story about rare diseases. There are events like this happening virtually all over this country today. And some of the audiences that we're really trying to focus on are those in the state legislatures, where advocates and legislative people come together to understand the burden of rare diseases and the impacts it can have on them, and therefore build the appropriate legislation and pathway to make sure that bills are passed that support rare disease patients. As a matter of fact, Nord's doing that in a very focused way with rare disease advisory councils. We've got them set up down in 16 states and are building them in others. I think 2021 is going to be an interesting year for us. The reason I say that is because we've just come off of a very difficult year with a pandemic that's impacted the rare disease community in a number of different ways and has really shown some of the inequities in the healthcare system for all of you that are watching today, the importance of the Rare Disease Advisory Councils is critical to the success of being able to communicate the story 
and the needs of the rare disease patient community. So in conclusion, I would really like to make sure that I recognize and thank all of those sponsors who have helped us make this day a reality. Without your continued support, none of this would happen. So a sincere thank you from all of us at Nord and the patient community. Taking part in events like today's are really important to the rare disease community. And we must always remember that alone we are rare and together we are strong. And as we continue today, I wanna to remind everyone if you wanna set your lines on mute or your, yourself on mute just to minimize background noise, please feel free to use this chat feature on the Zoom, it might be at the bottom, or perhaps depending on your browser, might be three dots that you need to click in order to see them. But this is our agenda for today. Um, we'll do brief introductions of each one of us. Um, we'll go through Nord's background and we have some great speakers. So thank you, um, uh, Representative DuBose, Katie Wright, uh, Daborski McKellen, Laura Hogan-Strang, and Christina Booth for joining us today as our speakers. We're also going to go over the state report card uh, that NORD has um, continued to update um, the last several years. We'll give you an update on our rare advisory council. And of course, um, we're gonna have trivia and a raffle at the end for some NORD swag because we all love NORD swag. I know I do. Um, uh, like I said, I am Joani. I'm one of the volunteer ambassadors um, here for the state of Florida. It's really an honor and really humbled to be able to do this. Um, in 2015, I uh, was looking for a potential diagnosis of ADD or ADHD for my son. Hello. Who at the time was, was only six years old and, and come to find out he was actually diagnosed with adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, where Fortunate that that is now one of the disorders that is tested through newborn screening. And um, he received treatment. Um, sadly, he lost his battle to ALD, adrenal leukodystrophy, just 17 months after diagnosis. Uh, and, and like many other, my sister also struggled to receive a diagnosis um, for many years and misdiagnosis for many years. Finally, here within the last year, she has received a diagnosis. and really is getting the care and, and the treatment that she needs um, for, for making her better. Uh, the the RAM network is um, rare action network. The goal is to ensure that the rare disease community is represented in all 50 states. And that's exactly the goal for us, that we can connect and represent all of our uh, Florida counterparts. And Sorry about that, I needed to unmute myself. Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, very exciting Rare Disease Day event. We're really happy to have all of you here with us. Um, I've got over 33 years experience in the rare disease community. Two of my three children were affected by a disease called Crab A leukodystrophy, which is a um, very rare neurologic condition. Um, my story started in in 1986 with the birth of my son and then continued in 1999 with the birth of my daughter who were both affected. Um, both of my children have passed away from the disease but over the years I've been uh, able to have the opportunity to work with many rare diseases uh, other than Crab A with many researchers have become an advocate in the rare disease community and I'm honored to have a position with the Florida Rare Action Network and, and the Nord community here in the state of Florida. So thank you very much uh, for being here. Fran? Uh, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Fran Hokanen. I have a seven-year-old daughter who has a form of adrenal insufficiency. Um, hers was diagnosed at birth. It was a uh, it was a very um, tumultuous time in a lot of ways, very um, different than you know you would read in a book or how it's how it's like to be a new mom. Um, not only was I a new mom, but I also was dealing with the you know fact that you know oh oh hey by the way you know this is the course of your daughter's life and the things that you're going to have to do, um, and it was a lot to take in. And so shortly thereafter, I had to um, work on emergency protocols 
for the treatment for her in emergency situations that are not um, easily accommodated by uh, local EMS, um, it's just because of it's a rare disorder. I think like, m like many of us listening, um, the, the treatments and the things that have to be done, it's not a regular thing that, that an ambulance would necessarily know about. So i um, got the medication, got some protocols in place, but it also opened up my eyes to the world of, of living with a rare disorder or ha being a caregiver of somebody living with a rare disorder, that there are so many places that we need help um, on a local level, on a state level, on a federal level. And so that's why when I worked with Nord on some stuff, um, becoming the ambassador for a while um, myself, and then now being the social media liaison and so social engagement liaison with, um, with RAND members, um, it's just really important to me to get that information out and get people the help that they need to uh, manage their disorder, cure their disorder, any, anything that they need to, to increase their quality of life, get them treatments, get them what they need so and deserve. So thanks for letting me be here. I think you're muted there, Johanny. Yes, I am. Um, our first trivia question, um, please feel free to use the chat feature. What is the definition of a rare disease? We'll give you a few minutes, of course, to, to get those answers um, from the chat. And we'll come back to, um, to those answers. I know Fran will, will kind of share the definition there and um, the answers that we're getting. We've got, we've got one taker, Linda. Linda, you did a good job. So for those of you who can't see the chat or haven't had a, ch a chance to peek at it yet, it is anybody with a condition that affects less than 200,000 people. And that's the U.S. definition. Your, Europe has a slightly different one, but yep, that, that is correct, Linda. Nice job. Thank you, Linda. No worries. Pleased, I am pleased to um, introduce um, Representative DuBose. We're, we're happy and thankful that he is our uh, House representative for the Rare um, Advisory Council here in our state. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, it is indeed a, uh, a pleasure and an honor to participate with you all today. And um, I got to tell you, just watching the videos and just being in this space, um, I'm really full. Um, I'm really honored to actually uh, carry this legislation in the Florida House. Um, I'm the uh, Democratic leader in the House, and the Senate sponsor is a Republican. So there's a bipartisan effort here, and I think that's very important. I think that speaks volumes to what this uh, legislation will do. It would um, provide a, a, a space, a, a voice for uh, a population that's underrepresented in the medical community. And um, I, um, my, my direct um, connection to all of this, and it's very personal as many of you have shared and those of you that are watching is uh, my mother um, was diagnosed with scleroderma and she um, dealt with this um, for about 18 years and um, she lost a battle with it in 09. And so I became her primary caretaker and the, just on this journey, um, there wasn't just a whole lot of information she was misdiagnosed with everything because, um, you know, her, her, her version of it was systemic. So they diagnosed her with everything except for scleroderma. And that was just because there's not a lot of space. There's not uh, a lot of education or dollars to um, research it. And so not only that, but... I watched my mother deal with something and she was isolated. It was just her. We knew no one else with it. We 
there was nothing. And so the interesting thing about um, my mom's journey is two things uh, I'll share with you. Um, one, I remember um, shortly after my mom passed, you know, I was online and, you know, I'm just reading more, learning more, and found out that there was a chapter in South Florida that provided, you know, not only education, but a support group. So for all these years, my mom was dealing with this by herself and not, well, her family was there, but no one else understanding what she was dealing with. And so um, I remember my, one of my mom's friends, who, who was a, a teacher, uh, she would leave work and she would come over sometimes and just sit with my mom and talk to my mom and they were friends and so forth. And I remember <clears throat> prior to being elected to the Florida House, I served as a city commissioner um, here in the city of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I remember I was sitting and I was writing a letter and I was writing it to my, uh, you know, my congressional delegation, my folks about, hey, you need to provide funding, at least to educate so that people would know. And my mom's friend, this is after my mom passed, she called me and she says, hey, Bobby, um, uh, you'll never guess what happened uh, to me today. And I said, I'm not even gonna try, just tell me. She said, I went to the doctor and um, I was diagnosed with scleroderma. So this whole time, because of the lack of, you had two people who had no idea, but they could have been a stronger support group. So th those are just some of my personal examples of why you know I'm personally so invested in this and I'm so honored to be allowed to uh, be in this space and be an advocate with you guys and uh, make sure that we do our part here in Florida and um, make sure that we make this advisory council a reality because there's so many aspects to what this can do. Um, and, you know, I'm speaking from a personal place, but this will affect, you know, many Floridians. So thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, carry this legislation and uh, share with you, you know, my story. And um, if, there, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to um, answer them. Thank you so much, Representative DeBeau. We are so honored to have you as part of our team here and helping to get this very important legislation passed. Um, we really welcome getting um, this RDAC, the Rare Disease Advisory Council, in session, uh, passed during this legislative session in Florida. So we're looking forward to working with you in support of the bill anything that we can do. We are just so grateful to have you on the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we're gonna introduce a few other speakers who are coming to us with their rare disease stories. And the first speaker that I'd like to introduce to you is Katie Wright. She um, has prepared a really great video for us to talk about her rare disease experience. And as you listen to these speakers, please be reminded that the, they are just small examples of the reasons that we need a rare disease advisory council in the state of Florida. Hi, my name is Janelle Hogan-Strang, and I am the clinical social worker for the Huntington's Disease Society of America Center of Excellence at the University of South Florida. As a designated center of excellence, we focus on both care and curing Huntington's disease. We are one of three center of excellences that serves the state of Florida. We serve about 300 patients a year. Huntington's disease is a fatal genetic neurodegenerative disorder that causes motor, cognitive and psychological impairment. It is a slow progressive disease lasting anywhere from 10 to 20 plus years before death occurs. It is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder, so it is not uncommon for our clinic to see multiple family members across multiple generations. Currently, there is no treatment other than palliative care for symptoms. We are currently in clinical trials for potential treatment and research continues to make significant gains to end this terrible disease. 
We need a rare patient voice in Tallahassee to help reduce the burdens to patients and caregivers. In Huntington's disease families, it is not uncommon for caregivers to care for multiple members with HD. One of the most profound things I've heard from an HD family member was, in HD, you are either a patient or a caregiver. I will get to be both. This is from somebody who was gene positive caring for their affected parent. Our patients need a voice to represent them regarding policy decisions that impact their life. The importance of that representation in regards to mental health, healthcare expansion policy, long-term care policy, medication coverage and assistance, and other unmet medical needs. In all areas of our government and policy making, the rare patient voice deserves to be heard. The Rare Disease Advisory Council will give our patients and their caregivers a voice to help them with their unmet medical needs. Until there is a cure, we can provide appropriate representation and care to our patients. I'm looking forward to working with Florida Rare Action Network to get legislation passed for Senate Bill 272 to create the RDAC. Protecting vulnerable patient populations is something that I'm passionate about. I'm a long-term survivor of a rare childhood leukemia. I know firsthand the struggles of living with a rare disease and its impact on the family system. The type of leukemia I have now has a 90% cure rate thanks to effective policies to get treatments and access to care. All rare disease deserve this level of advocacy and voice. I appreciate the opportunity to represent the Huntington's disease community, and I look forward to coming together with other rare voices to advocate for our collective needs. Thank you, Florida Rare Action Network, for the opportunity to speak on the rare patient voice, especially those living with Huntington's disease. Thank you so much. There's a little bit of confusion there for that being um, Laura, representing the Huntington's Disease Society and, um, and Katie Wright. So next up is uh, Taborski McClellan to tell his story. So uh, we'll listen, we'll listen to his story. His story. Hello, my name is Taborski McClellan. I currently live in Jacksonville, Florida, and I have Marfan syndrome. I was diagnosed with Marfan syndrome as a young kid, roughly around the age of 12, due to poor vision. Throughout my adult years, uh, I've had multiple complications uh, throughout due to Marfan syndrome. This is why I feel that having a rare disease council in the state of Florida will be an awesome idea. Having a rare disease council would assist people with rare diseases such as Marfan syndrome with educating as well as bringing more awareness to the medical field, um, news outlets, communities, families, friends, and again, most importantly, to the medical facilities. Uh, there's some medical facilities uh, such as emergency room personnel who have no idea what Marfan syndrome is and I'm sure this goes along with many other rare diseases. Um, having an RDAC to back this up would help us explain to insurance companies, uh, Medicaid, uh, other insurance uh, outlets, so to say, uh, with explaining in detail what people with rare diseases go through on a daily basis. Uh, this can touch on bases as far as co-pays. Most of the time with a rare disease, you see specialists and specialists typically have higher co-pays. Uh, having an RDAC would help uh, back us up on this as far as just explaining uh, why we would need additional assistance or, or could use more help based on the education uh, if the insurance companies, Medicaid and other uh, insurance outlets knew more about the condition. So again, having an RDAC council would help me uh, as an individual living with a rare disease on just explaining some ins and outs of my rare disease, which is Marfan syndrome. So again, I think this would be an awesome idea to bring forward the RDAC to the state of Florida. Again, my name is Taborski McClellan. Thank you. Have a great day. 
Thank you so much, Taborski. It's so important to know and understand all about the patient's rare diseases. We appreciate uh, you joining us today. Next, Next up, up, Dr. Should be Katie Wright's video. Okay. My apologies. I will have this up in a moment. No problem. No problem. While, While everyone's waiting, waiting, we can, we can think, think about, about what animal is a uh, representative of the rare disease community for NORD. So start thinking about that trivia question and we'll and be, we'll be and, then and then why, we'll, why that, that animal, animal was chosen. chosen. So if you can put your answers in the chat box, that would be great. And we'll have a, we'll circle back up. Um, so here's Katie. My name is Katie Wright, and I currently live in Tallahassee, Florida. I was born with a genetic condition called Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or VEDS. VEDS is a connective tissue disorder caused by a mutation in the gene that tells my body how to make collagen 3, an important protein that provides structural support to the arteries, aorta, organs, and skin. Because of VEDS, I am prone to life-threatening, spontaneous ruptures of the arteries and organs. I grew up in the Orlando area, and despite many years of trying to figure out what was wrong with me when I was a child, I did not get my diagnosis until I was 28 years old. In 2014, I saw a geneticist here in Florida for suspicion of VEDS, and I was told no one has it, and I didn't need to be tested. Now that I know I have VEDS, I know the experts estimate about 1 in 50,000 people have it, and most are undiagnosed, like I was. There is a simple genetic test for VEDS, but newborns without a family history are not regularly screened for this. Two years after that appointment in 2014, in March of 2016, I woke up in Winter Park, Florida with the worst neck pain I had ever experienced. My doctor prescribed me medication, but two months later, I was still struggling to function and turn my neck. Between March 2016 and November of 2016, I experienced three pain-free days which were abruptly interrupted by spontaneous, sudden reappearance of my pain while I was doing nothing to provoke it. I continued to try to get this pain diagnosed, but two emergency rooms, several urgent care centers, and several physicians all missed that I was experiencing a dissected carotid artery. By January 2017, I thought this pain would be with me the rest of my life. At 27 years old, early in 2017, I scoured my medical history on my living room floor for an answer. When I came across the clue into VEDS and looked it up again on the NIH website, I knew this is what had been missed. With certainty and dread, I realized I had a genetic condition with no cure and a 50% chance to live to 48 years old. Three months later, and on a waiting list to see a geneticist again, I felt hopeless. No doctor would diagnose me, and most did not take me seriously. I finally got a genetic test ordered by calling the geneticist in Florida who had missed my diagnosis, and I got my results in May 2017, a month after my 28th birthday. My dissection was finally diagnosed in September of 2017, four months later. Since then, I have had five mini strokes and moved back to Florida in the midst of these in 2018. Since I have come back to Florida, I have been told by a doctor that it wouldn't be worth trying to save my life if the aneurysm in my head ruptured because I have VEDS. I have had multiple doctors confuse my condition with another non-life-threatening form of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and insist that procedures the experts agree are dangerous for a patient with VEDS are totally fine for me. I have been interrogated and pressured and treated as if I'm going against medical advice for insisting that the doctors consult with the experts before subjecting me to invasive procedures that could kill me. Even with a life-threatening vascular condition, I have been turned away by vascular surgeons at my local trauma hospital who have told my primary care physician that they do not see patients with VEDS. I've sat for hours in emergency rooms and been told my condition is not life-threatening. 
Every day, I live with the knowledge that at any time, my arteries and organs may spontaneously rupture, and without a knowledgeable care net where I live, I may not survive it. My hope for a Rare Disease Advisory Council in Florida is for improving physician education and developing specialists who can diagnose and care for patients with VEDS, which based on my experience is an unmet medical need in most areas of Florida. Even living in the Orlando area, a medical hub, my genetic condition was missed time and time again. My artery dissection, an emergency that can cause a stroke, was missed as well. Developing a stronger network of educated specialists and increasing physician education is vital to recognizing patients with VEDS earlier in life and instituting lifestyle changes for these patients to help prevent life-threatening emergencies. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Katie. That a, was a great presentation. And I know you're listening in here today with us and what a great job you did on educating us about your disease and, and how important it is to not have to go through the diagnostic odyssey and how important it is to get screening at birth, uh, uh, such as VEDS on a newborn screening panel. Those are some things that the, that the RDAC will be able to look into and help support the community on. So yes, why do we, why does, do we, NORD, use a zebra as the symbol for rare disease? So a lot of people got it right in the chat box and it is the official symbol. And, it, and, and you know that most all zebras have the black and white stripes, which are very unique to the zebra. So everyone with a rare disease and even people without, we all have our own unique stripes. And that's the characteristic that we show um, as being the symbol for rare diseases. So good job, everyone. I think we have one more speaker and it is, she will be live with us. And her name is Christina Booth. We've already heard from Laura today. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Christina to speak. Hey everybody, um, can you hear me well? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so honored to speak with Nord and the Rare Disease Day. Um, my name is Christina Booth. I am a mother to an eight-year-old with severe hemophilia A with inhibitors. I also have mild hemophilia um, and am a carrier, which means that I will pass the genetic gene down to my child. I pass it to my son. I did not pass it to my daughter. Um, as we know, she'll have to be tested when she's older. But however, when I pass the carrier gene down to my children, as well as hemophilia, my son will then pass it to every daughter him and his wife have. And my daughter could pass it to either her daughters or her sons. So hemophilia is a genetic disorder that will follow my family until the end of time. Hemophilia is a rare bleeding disorder where the person does not clot properly. And you can think of it like dominoes one through 13. Although let me be honest when I say that the clotting cascade looks more like a bowl of spaghetti, but we're going to use dominoes for today. Caden's missing factor eight. So when he has a traumatic bleed or a spontaneous because he makes no factor eight, his dominoes start. Now Caden's body releases what we call his Elmer's glue. It's a small clot that gets there. However, when the dominoes keep going and seven goes to knock eight, Eight is not there. So Caden's Elmer's glue does not send his super glue, which is a fibrin sheath that goes over the blood clot and stops the bleeding. We don't really concern ourselves with scrapes. Uh, bloody noses are a problem. Mouth bleeds. Spontaneous injuries, trauma-related injuries, and joint bleeding is huge. Our kids regularly go through ankle surgeries, they have joints that are immobilized. Uh, internal bleeding is a big one, stomach, organs. And the problem is, is they can happen at any time. In the United States alone, there are only about 30,000 males affected with hemophilia. And today they don't actually know how many females because we're the ones carrying it and passing it along. My child's medication, because he created an antibody to the factor medication he needed to live, cost upwards of a million dollars a year. I, with my family and our insurance company puts out a million dollars a year for my child to continue to live a healthy, normal life. Hemophilia is manageable. If you do regular treatments and you keep on your profi schedule and you take care of your body, you can live with hemophilia. What happens if you can't afford to live with hemophilia? The rare disease 
uh, advocacy committee is huge. Advisory committee is huge for families like mine because we are a private pay family. We have private health insurance. My husband and I both work. And a lot of times you don't see private pay families issues represented. We have co-pays too and deductibles we must meet. My son only sees a hemophilia specialist. Well, what happens when we can't meet that? What happens when private pay families have to decide between paying a bill or taking their child to their medical appointment or paying their copay or deductible for prescriptions? My child's copay for his prescriptions are $300 a month. A month. That doesn't count when he's had a bleed and I need to order extra medication in the month for him. Our families deserve to be represented, but not just hemophilia families, all rare disease families. When decisions are made at the legislative level that have to do with health care, our families deserve to have a voice and a representative who understands what it means to be rare. We, the families, and all of the people who have lost loved ones to rare diseases, we will not go down quietly and we will continue to fight and advocate and educate every day. And I hope Thank you so much, Representative Du Bois, for being here. That the rare disease advocacy, <laughs> sorry, advisory committee is put into legislation, and families like mine and Anne's and Representative Du Bois, like your mom, get the care that they deserve and they need. Thank you so much for having me today. I will continue to wear my stripes. Wow, Christina, powerful to hear you speak about the challenges that you've been through with hemophilia. Uh, it brings emotion to my eyes to hear this. Um, your story's powerful and thank you very much, um, so much for being here with us and, and speaking about your, your challenges. Uh, and hopefully the RDAC can make a difference with those for your family. Next on our agenda, we're going to turn this program over to Anissa Reed who is NORD's Manager of State Policy for the Eastern Region of the United States. We welcome the next portion of this program to educate you more about the state of Florida and what we can do to make a difference. Anissa, thank you, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Anne. Good morning, everyone. Um, so let's start with the problem. More than 25 million Americans are living with one of the more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. So that breaks down to about one in 10 Americans. Even though that may seem like a lot, a lot of state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. So what's the solution? Nord believes it is to create RDACs, a diverse body to advise state government on the common obstacles that the rare disease community faces. We see this as an enormous opportunity for government officials and the rare disease community to work together to develop resources necessary to prevent and address barriers in a strategic way. There are a number of differences between each RDAC in different states. This includes the number of members on the council, varied members of the rare disease community represented in the council, where the council works out of, and duties and accountability mechanisms. Overall, each RDAC has the same goal of supporting the rare disease community by increasing the voice of rare disease patients and caregivers at the state level. We want to continue to increase the number of RDACs to give as many rare disease advocates a voice in state government as possible. NORD highly encourages that different state RDACs collaborate with one another to share ideas and best practices. We plan to continue to develop and release toolkits and one-pagers, host webinars, and convene additional meetings to support ongoing RDAC work throughout the United States. To date, 16 states have passed RDAC legislation. We also have RDAC bills that are currently being heard in several other states. And as mentioned, we are thrilled that Florida is one of them uh, to have RDAC legislation that has been introduced. So Florida's RDAC bill, as mentioned, is Senate Bill 272. It was introduced by Senator Baxley and Representative DeBose. A few important duties that the Florida RDAC would have is to develop recommendations for academic research institutions in the state, to conduct research on rare diseases, provide feedback to state agencies on issues that affect individuals with rare diseases, 
and create recommended strategies for healthcare providers on how to recognize and treat rare diseases. We are excited to announce that Senate Bill 272 unanimously passed through the Senate Health Policy Committee. Florida rare disease advocates can take action by making sure that they are signed up for RAN so they can receive action alerts so they're aware of critical times to reach out to their lawmakers. We also encourage Florida rare disease advocates to reach out to their elected officials to ask them to support this bill. Um, and you can find, I believe it will be dropped in the chat, how you can find your um, lawmakers in your district. And again, um, truly appreciate the support that Senator Baxley and Representative DeBose have given us. Um, current Senate bill, again, 272, and then um, the House bill number should be released within the next few weeks. We should have that maybe today. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah, um, I'll check in. Um, we, we got the language over in the Senate. We just had to amend it because they made an amendment, so to line up the same. And so hopefully Bill Draft and I'll have that today and we'll have a, uh, a number on it. That is exciting. Perfect timing for today's um, So now I'm going to jump into an overview of an important tool that we use at NORD. In 2015, NORD launched its state report card project with a goal of evaluating how effectively states are serving people with rare diseases. This year marks the sixth edition of the state report card which was compiled using data current as of November, 2020. So these are policy issues that NORD's report card focuses on. It's important to note, however, that these issues are not exhaustive. Uh, these issues touch on several critical and relevant policy areas at the state level, but with each issue included, there are still many others that are capable of impacting the lives of rare disease patients. So how do you find out where your state measures up? So you can select your state by clicking this link, and I believe it was also dropped in the chat box for your reference. Um, you can select it by clicking that link and um, finding your state, and you are also able to print this out, so it's a little bit easier to reference for you. Um, so these are just small snapshots of some policy issues that impacted the rare disease community in 2020. Current legislation and changes that have been made so far in 2021 have not yet been captured. So if your state recently passed any legislation to improve one of the policy issues, um, they might not have a high grade until the seventh edition comes out. So you'll likely see that change then. Um, the website provides a very detailed overview of the data, and you can also learn more about all of the policy issues in the methodology section of the website. So if you have any questions about our report card, then you can always send us an email at policy at rarediseases.org. And with that, I will turn it back over to Anne. I'm actually gonna turn this one over to Fran. Fran, our other, our community liaison for Florida um, has, uh, would, would like to speak and we'd like to have her take over this now. Sure, so we got one more trivia question. Um, how many rare disorders are there? And a bonus, what percentage affect children? Go ahead and type that in the chat box. Linda, you were correct. There's over 7,000. Does anybody know how, what percentage affects children? Just take a guess, percentage-wise. Linda Martin says 75 to 80%. You're close. It's actually just over 50% affect children, which if you think about it, that, that means a lifetime of care. Um, that, that would go on and associate with those who have chronic conditions that are manageable. Many, many are not, unfortunately. A lot of them don't have treatments. Um, and that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges with living with a rare disorder is, you know, finding the right people, but also having available treatments and the funding to get treatments either developed, researched, um, and then also when you have it, to be, pay, to be able to pay for it in a, uh, 
in a way that your your family can afford. So good, excellent. All right, so um, this weekend is the rare disease weekend, uh, Sunday being the actual day itself on the 28th, but we wanted to let everybody know that there are lots of ways to participate. You can, you know, wear a zebra outfit and tell people about it. You can um, put a sign in your window or your yard, letting people know, paint your face, do coloring pages with if you have kids. I mean, even adults like coloring pages. I know I do. It's very therapeutic for me. Um, you can create art. You, um, I know, I don't know about anybody else, but I love to paint and hide rocks. Um, you know, with a, I put hashtags on the back that say, you know, Rare Disease Day 2021, and people can post it on their pages and talk about why, you know, why would you paint a rock with stripes and stuff like that. So that's something that I actually did. Um, so those of you who live in Tallahassee, um, they are at various locations. I will leave it up to you to try to find them. Um, it's, we got a question in the chat, um, but would you remind, whoop, have, uh, Florida, um, remind me how many Flo in Florida who have a rare classification? Well, the um, the percentage, uh, we have about 21 million people as residents of Florida um, from the latest census data that we have, and it's about one in 10 is estimated to be affected with a rare disorder. So that would be just over 2 million people are estimated to have a rare um, disorder. Um, interestingly, I think though, Linda, you bring up a good point. There isn't really a mechanism to track how many people have rare disorders because there are more than 7,000. And so every single time, you know, you're, we have a new person diagnosed with one of 7,000, it isn't like there is necessarily a one-stop shot for all doctors to know that, or all people to know that somebody has a rare disorder. So um, that's sort of an estimate that's about 2 million people. So that's a really good question. Um, so, um, so back to the, 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 the showing your, your, your spirit this weekend, talking to people about it, not just this weekend, but every weekend, but, uh, and every, every time you have an opportunity to speak to someone about your rare disorder in a, in a way that, you know, naturally into the conversation, but if you do end up doing something with their family or you, um, you know, have some, you know, an outfit, you create something, we'd love to see it on social media. We are on Twitter and Facebook. There are our handles there at the bottom. Make sure you use the uh, hashtags rare disease day, show your stripes. And if you'd like share your rare is another one I've seen that's pretty popular. So we would love to see um, that. And if you have any ideas about what you're going to do or what people could do, uh, we'd love to see them in the chat as well. Um, Anissa, if you don't mind going, can you say don't go to the next slide for me? Beautiful, thank you. All right, so uh, how to get involved? Uh, check out our check out our website, rarefl.org. Pretty simple there. To, uh, see what we have to offer. Our contact information is always there if you need it. Um, if you haven't joined the Rare Action Network, at the top of the the page, whether you're on a desktop or on your phone, there's a there's a big orange button that says Join Ran. Um, hit that. Make sure you sign up. Uh, for, for that, because what that allows you to do is get emails directly from us. If, if, if um, you attend an event and you haven't joined RAN, you may not necessarily get new notifications. So being part of actual RAN is really great. They get you on that mailing list. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. As mentioned earlier, we have those. Um, and then if you have any other general questions about rare disorders, you can go to raredisease.org and that is Nord's website. Um, one, one other note that I actually didn't remember until just now, that if you are a parent having issues with the Gardner Scholarship um, and them allowing your, rare, your child with a rare disorder um, to get the, there's only so many listed on the Gardner Scholarship information page. If you have issues with that, give me um, give me an email and we can work that out for you. Nord has helped get that um, fixed up for Florida because it's very specific to Florida as opposed to a, a, a national thing. The Gardner Scholarship, um, which helps you get educational opportunities that maybe you couldn't afford otherwise um, for, for children. So if you have questions about that, let me know. My email's right there in the... Uh, and on the on the screen. If not, it's always at um, rarefl.org and we can help you out. And that's what I got, Anissa, thank you. All right, so I forgot, it's time for the drawing for a raffle prize. So what I did, it was everybody who is logged in today has been assigned a number in my, my magic cell sheet behind the scenes. It's in a random order. I didn't even do alpha order because I feel like, you know, those of us with a name in the middle feel like we don't get get a, a fair shake. 
um, cause we're like lost in the middle of nowhere. So I just basically assign everybody a, 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 a random number. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm putting in it. I have an, I have an app that I'm using that just basically says I have everybody who's in the room. I'm going to hit go and it's going to give me a number. And then I will call the name. We are going to select two winners. If your name is called, um, I'm not sure. And you said, you guys already have their mailing information from the registration or do you guys need to collect that from them? Um, once we draw a winner, I believe we're going to reach out to them and um, ask for that information. Wonderful. And while we do that, we want to remind everyone that even after the video, we're going to stay on for any open discussions, um, sharing your story. So please feel free to do that with us. We, we want to hear from you. All right. So looking at the number drawn, number 15 is Lourdes Humble. Congratulations. You are our first winner. Whoa, thank you. Right. I know we've seen you on a couple of our events. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to get as involved as possible, learning along the way. Excellent, excellent. Love to hear. All right, well, you get one of those cool swag bags of that stuff you saw on the screen. And I'm going to draw one more winner here. All right, number 13. That is uh, Lisa Riccioni. R R R Sorry, butchering last name, Riccioni. I know she was on. Yep, there she is. Lisa, congratulations. And Lisa, I don't, I'm not sure you, um, I didn't see your name on the original registration list. If you wouldn't mind um, dropping us your email or sending an email to one of us, I think that would be helpful. Um, I wanna make sure that we have that information from you. So congratulations guys. Show your, uh, you'll be able to show your, show your rare. That's really exciting. Great, thank you. And then act correction, we actually do have those who registered their address. So we will be able to, to take care of that. Thank you. Um, and I'm gonna close this out with a brief video and then we can stay on as um, they mentioned for additional conversation. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At NORD, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others, and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the Volunteer State Ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our states. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. But what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At NORD, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. NORD support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, NORD, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at NORD, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community. On Rare Disease Day, and every day. Great, well, thank you all. And then we will open it up now for um, some additional conversation. I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to share my story. Uh, it was really, um, really great. And I love that you put this together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's so important, I think that um, 
we just share and educate um, everyone that, that that's around us. Um, certainly is the biggest struggle, you know, as I talked about my sister all these years going on diagnosed and, and really preventing her, similar to your story where there she's being told it's this is migraine. Um, but I can't move, I can't do this. Well, it's just a migraine. Maybe you had a stroke, maybe that, that could be it. So it's definitely really important, especially um, emergency rooms and um, everyone really, um, you know, struggles with, with just getting diagnosis. And I think so early is so important, you know, for me, um, three years went by before my son got a diagnosis and had he been diagnosed earlier, I think perhaps the story would be a little different for, for us and for our family. So thank you for that. It takes a lot of, of courage. And, and so that does not go unrecognized by us. Thank you. Hey, Karen, I just wanted to, I see you in the chat um, asking about, is it La Flora? La Flora. Um, if you want to send us an email, maybe we can, we can um, reach out to our networks and see if there's somebody who can connect with you. We're not, I don't think anybody necessarily on the call may have it, but definitely um, worth um, sending us an email. Anyone else like to share some comments or ask some questions? Please feel free. The floor is open to all of you. They're still on the call with us. Just unmute yourself if you do have a question. Well, I'd just like to thank you all for all the work and effort for putting this together. I was, um, you know, so excited that that this was happening. I, I work with Janelle at the HDSA Center, but I also have Huntington's disease. My mother had Huntington's. Um, it is a, a family disease. So I'm so glad that she was able to follow up and we can follow up because you know, with, with our disease, it's, it shows up pretty much in every generation and you're either, you know, and it can go undiagnosed, you know, so we have a lot of problems with people, they stagger, they slur in some of the early physical movements. So they get, you know, they get put in jail or they have problems, emotional problems. So they all rage. And if you call like domestic abuse, they'll get put in jail and then people can't rescind that you know, the spouse can't take it back once somebody's been put in jail. And, you know, nursing homes won't take our patients because they're difficult to treat or the medications they need aren't allowed in nursing homes. So we have a lot of homeless, you know, and that's, you know, and our stuff starts with usually pr prodromal things with like, you know, severe depression. Um, the second cause of death is suicide. We have a huge suicide rate, um, you know, and it's not just the physical movements, it's the mental, it's cognition, you know, it's like Alzheimer's. So it's, they call it a combination of Alzheimer's, of, um, you know, psychiatric issues and um, Parkinson's, you know, uh, balance. So it, you know, and, and eventually you wind up completely locked in in bed, you know, so it's like ALS. So getting, you know, getting some joining together, like you were saying, you know, as just one rare community, there's not much we can do, but together, all of us, and having a voice, there's a lot we can do. So, I mean, I am symptomatic to now I can talk some sometimes in the days I can't, but I'm glad I got this out anyway. Um, and I'm very grateful and very happy to be part of this. Thanks, Lisa. It's so nice to see your face. I know we've had a couple conversations, so it's wonderful getting to see you today. And thanks for joining. Uh, joining us and thanks for sharing your story and congrats on winning a swag bag yeah, wow oh boy <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, see Alice when you were doing something with your head you have a zebra in the background a picture you're muted I think you're muted so I couldn't hear you but Yeah, we see your zebra. It's really fun. 
I want one now, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Still in this part. You're, you're unmuted now, Alice, if you wanted oh. to say something. Oh. Yes. First of all, I want to thank all of you for your sharing your stories. Um, actually, I'm a grandparent, not a parent, of a child with Phelan McDermott syndrome, which is um, not a, in her case, it's not a missing chromosome, it's a chromosome that's misplaced. And it's basically, although I'm not a medical person, obviously, we've been involved since her diagnosis at the age of a year. She's now 14. Um, it presents as, a, a, as autism, but not pure autism. So she, she has no speech. She makes sounds. Um, we really don't know if she, we think she, she recognizes us. She's not toilet trained. She needs assistance with... Um, dressing, feeding, et cetera. And not, not to be morose, but this was our first grandchild and we were devastated. She attends a private school in Manhattan. So we started a parent, a grandparent group. We initiated it mainly for my own selfish reasons to educate myself as to what her condition entailed and also to have support from other people because I feel that's essential from a caregiver standpoint. Um, we own a home in Florida, but we're New York residents. I would like to become more involved, you know, to find out what ways that we could contribute to the Nord community and also to understand more. Um, I think I have a basic understanding that it's more of an umbrella organization that raises money for research for all rare diseases, not one specifically as displayed by the examples of so many people who are afflicted with different rare diseases. So I thank you so much. I thank you for letting me share something. And I hope you have my information. And I hope, you know, we also have reached out personally to the Phelan McDermott syndrome organization, which is specific to our granddaughter's rare disease. So I would appreciate hearing from any of you giving us any information as to how we could get more involved and how we could contribute to advocacy in New York. Thank you again. By the way, she's now 14. How old is she? She'll be 14 in August. Um, I, my, my husband's correcting me, so I, I stand corrected. <laughs> uh, thank you again. Thank you, Alice. Karen, I didn't, did you, I see you left a, a, um, a kind of a question. I think it's a, maybe a rhetorical question, but it's um, talking about um, the major tertiary care centers are out of the loop. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I've ever talked to any rare family that's ever said that their diagnostic journey was smooth and, and that they've ever on first go met somebody who understood what was going on. I think in my daughter's case, I think I was very, very lucky to have um, her primary care um, giver who, who came into the room when she was born, figured out something wasn't quite right. Um, but I will say the reaction from the rest of the medical people in there was if, if tra traumatizing um, is, is a strong enough word, I, I'm I'm probably underselling how not only them traumatizing. I don't, you know, I don't know how many live births they've seen where they're where they figured out something was wrong immediately, um, or or not, you know, not what they would expect. Um, but I will say, her primary care physician knew something was wrong immediately. Contacted an endocrinologist, got her handled. Um, but I don't think I've really talked to very many people ever that have ever had a, a smooth diagnostic journey where they just people knew what they're talking about they took them seriously they listened I mean it's unfortunate that that's just kind of a reality of how it goes um and 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 educating you know doctors and medical staff and and everyone in in various places that touch the rare community I think is kind of where we all have a passion for it so um if you wanted to share more Apologies for going on a little bit more there, but if you wanted to share, we'd welcome to hear you. If not, we're we're um we're always here to advocate and, and um we can talk personally one on one if you don't want to share from a group. So let us know how we can help you. Um, we'll look forward to that email from you. Is 
anyone else have any comments or questions or things they'd like to share with the group? Johanny, would you like to give some closing remarks then possibly? Absolutely. So I want to, we want to thank everyone for, for joining us today, but also, you know, remember this weekend, it's really all about showing our stripes, educating. As you all can see, I'm wearing my rare disease day shirt um, from the North site, you know, from last year, Fran has her, um, her zebras. So I can tell you, I'll be, I'll be doing this the entire weekend. We've got rare Florida and I'm really just educating. You'd be surprised how many times I get asked what is this all about? And it gives me an opportunity to talk about, well, this is what it is and, and kind of share that 30, 30 second elevator pitch of what rare disease is and, and how they can join. And sometimes I've had people, I'm like, yeah, let's go here, the rare action network, let's join, you know, help us support what we can do. So I think we, we'd love to see your pictures. Remember our um, Facebook page, tag us on there um, so we can, we can post them. Um, this entire weekend. I think you'll see some things from us um, for sure, but we'd love uh, for you to engage with us through social media this weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.